Joel asked over on Facebook, what constitutes a valid sample size for most educational research? That's a great question, Joel. Let's get into it. Hi, friends. I'm Matthew Courtney, and I help schools help kids. And on this channel, we talk all about evidence-informed school improvement. So if you're into that, make sure you like, subscribe, and follow from wherever you're watching, and come be a part of our community of improvers. All right, so let's get into Joel's question. Let's start by talking first about what is an analytic sample. The analytic sample is the sample upon which a researcher has performed their analysis. Now, it's important to note that this is different than the sample of students who maybe started an intervention or a research project at the beginning of a study because of a phenomena called attrition, where people voluntarily leave a study during the process. So the analytic sample is really only the group of students and their outcomes and performances that the researcher has collected at the end, determined to be valid, and then performed the analysis on. So it's really important to think about who are the kids that we're looking at in this sample um, and how do they relate to the work that we're doing and that we want to do with this particular intervention that we're studying. Now, when it comes to sample size, the U.S. Department of Education has given us some guidelines for what it determines to be a large sample for the purposes of evidence-based decision-making in education. According to the U.S. Department of Education, a large sample size is one that has 350 or more students or 50 or more groups of 10 or more students. And this is a great benchmark that we can use as we begin to think about our own uh, research use and deployment journey, but it is rather strict and rather limiting, and it's sometimes going to be hard to find uh, research studies that meet this large sample size threshold, and it might not always be appropriate for a particular study or intervention to be studied on a sample of 350 or more students or 50 or more groups of 10 or more students. So let's talk a little bit about some other considerations for um, thinking about analytic sample sizes and what a good or valid analytic sample size might be. The first thing we want to do is consider our study design. So there are lots of different kinds of study designs. There are lots of ways which a researcher might go about trying to understand the ins and outs of an intervention. And some of those study designs, like a randomized controlled trial or a quasi-experimental design, might lend themselves more easily to a large sample of 350 or more students. But it's not always appropriate for every kind of study to use this large sample size. Consider, for example, a single case study design. Single case designs are really common and appropriate in special education settings where we're looking at very unique um, combinations of disabilities or, or learning considerations for an individual student. And you may encounter a student who has a very rare combination of comorbid disabilities um, or learning challenges that we need to think about. In that instance, it is most appropriate to study the interventions related to that student using a single case design. Single case design meaning we're gonna take a baseline set of data, we're gonna give an intervention, we're gonna take the intervention away, we're gonna collect data through all of that, and we're gonna see what happens for that intervention. Did it help? Does it have staying power? In this instance, it is most appropriate to use a sample size of one, and it would be inappropriate for a researcher to try to find 350 or more students with the same combination of comorbid learning challenges in order to um, create this large sample size. Now, it is important whenever we are looking at single case designs to remember that that is a one student sample. And so it may or may not work for a student in your classroom that looks similar um, or has similar learning challenges or concerns. So it's important that we consider as much literature as possible, as many single case examples as possible when making an evidence informed decision within that context. Another important consideration is the deployment process for the intervention itself. It would be inappropriate to to deploy a study on an intervention with 350 or more students if the intervention is designed to only be delivered in small groups. In this instance, we might look at that 50 or more groups of 10 or more students, and we might use some of that comparison. But even then, it might not be appropriate if an intervention is meant to be delivered with only three kids um, in front of me in a classroom. So the deployment fidelity is really important when thinking about the um, impact of sample size 
on our decision-making processes. Because if we're going to take an intervention that is designed to be deployed on a very small group of students, and we're going to deploy it with fidelity also on a very small group of students, it's important that we are aligning all of that up. And so in this case, it would be inappropriate for a researcher to deploy that research study on a larger scale because it's not designed to be captured at that small scale window. So that's an example of a time where that US Department of Ed guidance may not always align. Again, replication is key here. And so we want to see as many pieces of research that point to the success of an intervention as possible when we're working with those small sample designs in that uh, specific deployment scenario. We should also consider where an intervention is within its life cycle. Most interventions start as an innovation. A teacher, an administrator, a researcher has a bright idea. They pull some kids together, they pull some classroom data, and they try their idea out and see if it works. And in the case of innovation, it would, again, be inappropriate to immediately launch an innovation on a large-scale study. It is better to pilot using some elements of action research or improvement science on a small scale to test out an innovation before we scale it up. Why does that matter? A couple of reasons. First, we don't know for sure if it's going to work for any students, and it might cause harm to students. It might cause students to go backwards on whatever the intended outcome is. And so ethically, it's inappropriate for us to immediately launch out um, a new innovation on a large analytic sample. We got to start small. That way we can minimize negative impact, and we can also address, spot, and reverse that negative impact immediately on a small group of students. Then, as we experiment with our innovation, our studies get bigger and longer and bigger and longer until we get to the large-scale longitudinal randomized control trials that many of us are familiar with. And those usually come out of the university setting um, or sometimes out of nonprofit research organizations. But within a classroom setting, that scales gets really hard. And so, Early innovations are unlikely to have that large scale analytic sample because of our own responsibility. It's also really important that you consider your own student population when reflecting on the impact of an analytic sample within the context of a research study. It's great if a piece of research shows that an innovation or an intervention has done remarkable things for a student population. But if that student population looks different than yours, you're going to have a harder time replicating and finding and seeing those same results in your local context. So I think it's really important to always go back and say, who are our kids? What is our population? And how does the population of this analytic sample relate to ours? Now, that's not to say that a rural school cannot learn and make an evidence-informed decision from research conducted in an urban setting, for example. But it is important to remember that lifestyles in an urban setting are different than lifestyles in a rural setting. And that becomes a confounding factor as we try to replicate that intervention with fidelity in our school. It becomes a factor that makes it more difficult for us to really have that same level of success with our students in our setting. So always reflecting back, does this analytic sample look like the kids in front of me, the kids who I work with every day? And if it does, that's awesome. And if it doesn't, we need to put just a little more scrutiny into our decision-making processes. Finally, as we wrap up, the last piece of advice, I've said this already in this video, but consider the rest of the literature. We should never be making evidence-informed decisions in our schools based on only one piece of literature. So if you find an analytic sample that meets that U.S. Department of Education guideline for a large sample size that also aligns with your analytic sample, your population right in front of you, that also aligns with your decision-making goals and outcomes, that's great. And you should run with that study, but you need to read all the rest of the literature too, because one study does not make an evidence-informed decision. We need to really check into the volume of research um, that is available to us all the time right in front of us. We need to make sure we're checking in with that, we're synthesizing that information, and we're really making the best decisions possible. Well, that's it for this FAQ video today. If you have other questions that you'd like me to answer in a video like this one, drop it below in the in the comments, in the chats, DM me on social media, and I'll add it to the queue of future questions for future videos. See you next time, friends.